It's impossible to understand how good Michael Jordan was if you've never watched a video of him playing. You can't comprehend the commanding stage presence of Taylor Swift if you've never sat in the crowd. You can't appreciate the world-shaking message of Jesus if you've never studied his most audacious sermon. In one brief message, projected to a great multitude of people gathered on a mountainside, his words that day were so surprising and so powerful, they altered the trajectory of human history. If we believe Jesus was inviting people into the best life possible, it's worth an in-depth look into the life he invited us to live. This week, best sermon ever. Again, not this one, okay? Jesus gave a sermon in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And you may be familiar with it, or maybe you are not. In fact, I talked to a young man after the first service today who grew up going to church a little bit with his grandparents, but he was not familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. And in fact, in his church experience, he hadn't experienced a church that talked about Jesus much at all. So we believe that Jesus is the foundation here uh, for our faith. And so we talk about him a lot, but we really want you to lean in for the next several weeks on this particular message that he gave, because at the heart of this message is really what Jesus was all about. We're going to start looking at the actual text of his sermon next week. This week, I want to prepare us for what's coming in the weeks ahead. Because this week, I want us to focus on a topic I don't hear talked about very much, and that topic is the genius of Jesus. I believe that Jesus was a genius. In fact, Dallas Willard once called him the smartest man who ever lived. And yet, when I always see these lists of greatest geniuses in the history of the world, I never see Jesus on them. And I think it's because Jesus was a genius of character. And lots of people just don't think of genius in that way. He never started a company. He was never on the Fortune 500. He didn't even have a Twitter account. Was he even real? Like that's, you know, but, but Jesus was absolutely a genius. Now, my first, uh, the first time I remember thinking about genius very much was in the late 90s and the early 2000s when Budweiser released a series of commercials, audio ads, called Real Men of Genius. And there was a narrator who would come on and he would salute a man of genius every week. And I actually, uh, I downloaded one of the scripts from one of these commercials to tell it to you so that you could also pretend that it's the late 90s and you're sitting in your car listening to the radio. For those of you who are younger, radios used to be these things that we had. (laughs) Don't worry about it. Look it up, you know, you can look it up on the internet. Watch a TikTok video about it. Okay, so uh, this one was called uh, Bud Light Presents Real Men of Genius. And then the narrator would come on and say something like this. Today, we salute you, Mr. Restroom Toilet Paper Refiller. Like a brave soldier, you storm hostile territory, delivering much-needed supplies to your men. Should you leave one roll or two, or perhaps that giant 10-pound super roll? While others rest, you can't, because somewhere there's a guy with his pants around his ankles doing the bunny hop in search of a fresh roll. So crack open a nice cold Bud Light, masters of the men's room, because if you don't do your business, we can't do ours. Right? (laughs) So that was the real men of genius. They had like 50 of these commercials on all kinds of topics. In fact, my favorite one wasn't appropriate for this morning. And you're like, what the restroom one was? Yeah, my favorite one's even worse than that. So, okay. So I, I even asked my son this morning, I read that to him and he was laughing. I was like, you think that, that that would be pretty funny? And he was like, yeah, but I don't know what that has to do with church. And I was like, no one else will either. It'll be fine. So <laughs> that was my first touch of genius. Like, like oh, genius. What is a genius? And then as, as I got a little bit older, I started to think about, okay, what, what, who are examples of actual genius? Maybe besides just the men's toilet paper refiller who we love, but maybe he doesn't fit the classical definition of genius. A lot of times when we think about genius, we think of someone kind of like Leonardo da, Leonardo da Vinci, right? This man was a, a brilliant sculptor and painter, but he also was way, way ahead of his time as invention, on inventions. This man had a whole uh, diaries and diaries of inventions he came up with, including things like the helicopter and the submarine, hundreds of years before it would be uh, technologically feasible to do these things because of the materials he had to work with, but he was way, way ahead of his time. Perhaps the truest Renaissance man that has ever lived, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, I think of people like like Orson Welles, who was, I think, a genius of film. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, his film Citizen Kane, right? It came out in the 1940s, but 
I remember watching it in college, and I thought that it probably wouldn't be very good because it was in black and white. What good could possibly come of a black and white film? And then I couldn't believe, I mean, within the first 10 minutes of the film, I was transfixed by some of the images that he had figured out a way to get. And some of the shots, like the camera's like moving through tables uh, across a crowded restaurant, just things that I was like, how did he do that? No computer animation graphics, right? Uh, he, no one had done any of these things before. He, they were, he and his crew were inventing all of this stuff out of whole cloth, like just a genius. He, he approached cinema in a different way than anyone ever had before, and cinema was never the same afterward. Now, as so he got older, like, he actually kind of fell out of favor in Hollywood. In fact, he's quoted as an old man saying, I started out my career on top, and I've been working my way down to the bottom ever since. And it was after his passing, actually, that his films and much of his genius was finally recognized by uh, many of the reviewers and, and, uh, and uh, cinematographers worldwide. So, so that's someone who comes to mind when I think of genius. I think of Katherine Johnson, who was with the NASA space program. She was one of the human computers in the 1950s and 60s with NASA. In fact, John Glenn, the very first astronaut to orbit the Earth, would not leave on his mission until Catherine specifically had run the numbers herself to make sure it would work. That's how much he trusted her. Uh, the, the, the field of mathematics and orbital mechanics were never the same once Catherine Johnson got a hold of them and went forward. I, when I think of genius, I also think of uh, Steve Jobs. Right? Steve Jobs didn't uh, invent all of the stuff at Apple. In fact, it was started by Steve Wozniak, his, his partner at the beginning, who did a lot of the technical things. But, but Jobs had a vision and a way of seeing the world that was unlike anybody else. And he had also just this, this, uh, this nonstop, can do, we're gonna make it happen attitude. In the biography called Steve Jobs, creative title, by Walter Isaacson, uh, Isaacson recounts a story that was told to him by a number of people. Uh, in the early days of the Mac computers, Steve Jobs was unhappy with the boot up time of the computer. And so he walked into one of his engineers and he says, I need this to boot up 10 seconds faster. And the engineer said, Steve, like, we, 10 seconds, that is, a, that is a colossal amount of time to shave off the boot time. Like, we just can't do it. So Steve Jobs asked him, could you do it if it would save a life? And he said, maybe if it would save a life. So then Jobs went to the whiteboard and he showed him, okay, let's say the Mac has 5 million users, okay? And let's say that there's an extra 10 seconds of boot up that they have to sit through every single day. That amount of users times that amount of time per day, that's about 300 million hours per year of boot time that our users are having to sit through. And when you add that up, that's 100 lifetimes per year. Lives depend on this, make it happen. He left the room, and a few weeks later, the engineer came, out, came back to him and had cut 28 seconds off of the boot time, right? So when we think of genius, these are some of the people that come to mind, and what they have in common are, I think, at least four set of qualities. In his book, The Genius of Jesus, Erwin McManus lists four qualities that I think are helpful in, in us thinking about what genius looks like. The first one is this. A genius is original. They see the world from a perspective that is never existed before, right? It's in, it's in, and in doing so, they introduce new ideas into that world. Jesus was like this. No one expected uh, the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, to look like Jesus looked. And certainly no one expected that person to come in and, and mess with all their laws and preconceptions as much as he did. He was completely original. Uh, heretical. I, I love that they chose this word, actually. A genius is heretical. And what he means by that is they violate the status quo and they challenge our most deeply held beliefs and values. Like, when someone does that, it makes people very, very uncomfortable. Like, like violating the status quo, like, that has a cost. Jesus ultimately wasn't killed because he healed people, right? He wasn't killed because of his miracles. Jesus was killed because he went against the Roman and the Jewish religious establishment in the first century. And that makes people very, very uncomfortable. In addition, genius is transformative. Uh, their lives become a marker of before and after. Think of, for instance, the release of the iPhone in 2007. And while Jobs didn't create that all by himself, obviously there was a whole team of engineers and technicians and designers behind that work. He was one of the ones that had the primary vision for it. The iPhone has completely changed the world. There's a before and after. Whether you have an iPhone or an Android or whatever, the world is not the same as it was before then. That's why when you walk into restaurants, you see people like, you know, eating by the glow of their phone. Uh, conversation has become uh, less, we've become less capable of it, basically, in the last number of years. There's been good things. We have information at our fingertips, and we can find videos of cute puppies instantly, no matter where we are in the world. And that's great. But there's been some major downsides of that as well. But whether you love it or loathe it, there's no doubt that the world is different 
following the introduction of the iPhone in 2007. Similarly, the world is different following Jesus. We literally divide our calendar into before he was born and after he was born. But in addition to that, the value system of the entire world has changed because of the teachings of Jesus. There's a British historian named Tom Holland, not the Spider-Man actor, who wrote a book called Dominion a few years ago. And he, he com compared and contrasted the values of uh, pre-Jesus and the values post-Jesus. Tom Holland is not a Christian. He's an atheist or an agnostic. He's not sure what he thinks about Christianity. But even he, as a secular scholar, says there is no denying the influence that Jesus had on the world. He's, he writes this. He says, the heroes of the Iliad, favorites of the gods, golden and predatory, had scorned the weak and downtrodden. That's what people were used to. So too, for all the honor that Julian paid them, had philosophers. The, the starving deserved no sympathy. Beggars were best rounded up and deported. Pity risked undermining a wise man's self-control. Only fellow citizens of good character who through no fault of their own had fallen on evil days might conceivably merit assistance. This was the world that Jesus is speaking into. Like whatever your lot in life was, that was on you. And if you were poor or if you were disconnected from the upper uh, echelons of society, that was on you and no one had any assistance coming to you. But post-Jesus, that changed. As, as Tom Holland says, it was after Jesus, right, that it seemed that God was closer to the weak than to the mighty to the poor than to the rich. Any beggar, any criminal might be Christ. So the last will be first and the first last. I wanna talk about transformation. The genius of Jesus transformed the entire value system and what our concepts of justice and the dignity of each and every person were. Pre-Jesus and post-Jesus, there is a massive difference in the way that we think about those concepts worldwide. I, I don't think there's anyone that has changed the way that the world thinks more than Jesus Christ has. How he could ever be left off a list of geniuses is far beyond me because he was, by definition, transformative. And then finally, genius, geniuses are extremists. They're consumed in their pursuit of the creative act and con convinced of the singular importance of their passion. They know what they're about and they focus on it and they follow after it. They are like a dog with a bone. They will not let it go. This is Jesus, and we'll look actually in just a moment at Luke chapter 2 to see that this started for him at a very, very young age. Now, here's what's interesting about genius. Genius is transformative, but it's typically not transferable. Like, if I were to have been able before his death to spend uh, several days hanging out with Steve Jobs, I wouldn't have left my time with Steve being able to be a brilliant engineer, programmer, or tech entrepreneur, right? His, his, it's transformative. My life has been changed by the genius of Steve Jobs and Albert Einstein and, all, and everyone who worked with NASA. Your life has been changed by those things too. So it's transformed our lives, but their genius was not transferred to our lives. Hanging out with them does not transfer their genius to us. Here's why I think Jesus has peak genius, okay? The genius of Jesus is transformative and transferable. Because it's a genius of character, the people who hung out with Jesus actually became more like Jesus. In fact, after his death and resurrection and ascension, it is the early disciples, his apostles, who for most of our experience with them as we read through the Gospels, they are just yellow belly chickens, like they, you know, hard-headed, stubborn. They can't understand what it is Jesus is saying a lot of times. They just, they're not impressive men for most of the Gospels. But after spending a lot of time with Jesus and being witnesses to his death and resurrection, they're transformed men. And the genius of the life and character of Jesus gets transferred onto them. And they put it on display for the early church. I want you to lean in for the next several weeks. Because I believe the genius of Jesus is transferable to you as well. If you long for that, if you want to become more Christ-like, it's transferable, but the only way to actually have it transferred to you is to spend time with Jesus, learning from Jesus, how to be like Jesus. That's, that's what we call being a disciple. And whether you are a longtime Christian, or if you're still not sure what you think about faith, you're still not sure what you think about Jesus, you're not sure if any of this is real, I invite you to lean in, because 
I want us together as much as we can from the most important sermon the world has ever heard, the best sermon ever. And I think over the next several weeks, we have the opportunity to do that. Today, I want to show you just how early on the genius of Jesus started to leak out of him that the others around him saw. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there with us, we're going to be looking at Luke and chapter 2, and we're going to start with verse number 41. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. Note, it does not say that his parents were bad parents. It doesn't say that they didn't care about him or that they lost him because they were just, you know, too busy talking about the latest sports scores. It just says that they thought that he was with their party, okay? Uh, I went to Disneyland a few days ago with some friends of ours who were visiting from Pennsylvania. Uh, they hadn't gotten to go before, so we were really excited to be able to take them. I have two kids, Jack and William. Jack is 10, William is 7. Jack is obedient, and William is also a child I have. So we... <laughs> We went to Disneyland together, and we had a really great time together. But you know what happened? Every, every, it seemed like every 30, 45 minutes, I would look up, and I would look around, thinking that Will was over here, or that you know, he was with one of our friends over here, or with my wife over there. And I would say, where's Will? And it's the silence that would follow that question that was bothersome, OK? To such a degree, we, we had to like, track him down so many times. Because he gets excited and distracted about things. He'll see Mickey. He's like, oh, Mickey. And he'll just kind of walk over, you know, and just forget about the rest of us. He's not trying to be disobedient in those moments. We don't think, but he gets distracted really easily uh, to, to the degree that <laughs> as the night was winding down, I was talking to one of the teenagers uh, of, the, of, of our friends. Uh, his name is Riley. And I, and I said, like, how was your day? And he was like, oh, I enjoyed this. I enjoyed that. And then we started talking about William. And he said, yeah, William gives me a lot of anxiety. <laughs> I, said, I live with it every single day. So, uh, so you, you understand what it's like to try to keep up with kids who will sometimes like, be curious on their own and head out. And in the first century, what they assumed was, right, he's with the rest of the party. They would have traveled from Nazareth down to Jerusalem every year for the Passover celebration. The Passover celebration was a remembrance. It was a remembrance of God leading them out of Egypt through Moses and securing for them a place in the world. That Israel would be a blessing so that the whole world could be blessed and be brought to God. So every year they would celebrate this Passover. The men were supposed to go to Jerusalem and make sacrifices for their families. The women didn't have to go, but we're told here that Mary goes with Joseph. What this is showing us is that Mary and Joseph were very devout. They were very serious about their faith. And they didn't have to stay the whole week. They could just go for a few days. But it seems that they did stay the whole week. And again, it's just showing us how devout they were. And they would probably travel in a caravan of a number of other families and just assume that Jesus was with one of the other families. But they travel a whole day away because it would have been probably 80 miles and it would have taken them about four days to get from Nazareth to Jerusalem. About 20 miles a day we think they probably could have covered. So as they head back to Nazareth from Jerusalem, they break out, make camp that first night, and they don't see him. Jesus is gone. Can you imagine, right? It's not just that you lost him. It's not like he's just over there talking to Donald Duck. It's like, oh, we are a day away now. And if you're Mary and Joseph, think about this added responsibility. You know that you've been given stewardship over the Savior of the world. You are in charge of the most important human who has ever been born, and you lost him. <laughs> Doesn't feel good. So they start back. When he didn't show up that evening, they started look for, looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Verse 46. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. How old is Jesus in this story? Twelve. Twelve. If he were another year older, he would be? Three. Your math skills are amazing. <laughs> So, so Jesus is 12 years old in this story. A year later, he'd be 13. At 13, you are now responsible for having memorized and having some knowledge of the faith of your father. All right, so, but at 12, he's been taught a lot of things, handled a lot of things, but he probably doesn't have to be super responsible for really understanding all of it. And yet at 12 years old, a year before he even has to be responsible for it, he is sitting in the temple in Jerusalem with some of the greatest religious leaders of his day, and for three days, he has been asking them questions and speaking with them. Now, these religious leaders in the temple, years later, would be some of the very religious leaders that Jesus would speak against. At this time, he is trying to understand them and trying to gain everything he can from their knowledge of the scriptures. 
And there was a story that these religious leaders would have known in the first century as Jesus is talking to them. And it is the story of Israel. Very briefly, the story of Israel. God chooses Abraham out and says, I'm going to bless you that you may be a blessing for all the world. In other words, like, I want to restore my relationship with the world. And Abraham, I'm going to use you to restore it. I'm going to bless you. And in your blessing, you will bless others. And they will come into right relationship with me. Abraham uh, and his descendants end up, there's a, there's a famine in the land, and then they get uh, taken into slavery in Egypt. They're in slavery for 400 years, and then Moses leads them through the Red Sea out of slavery. They cross over, but then they sin against God, and they have to wander in the desert for 40 years before God actually takes them into the promised land in order for them to have a whole place for themselves where they can be blessed so that they can be a blessing for others. There's a period of a number of different leaders that go back and forth, and eventually they ask for a king, and God doesn't want them to have a king, but they ask for it again, and nicely this time. And so God says, okay, uh, I'm simplifying things a bit. God didn't ever want them to have one, but they were insistent. So they have a king, and he's Saul, and he doesn't actually work out very well. But then they get another king, and that's King David. And David, for them, is the greatest king that Israel will ever know, actually. David uh, starts off his life very strongly. He's a man after God's own heart, but he doesn't end it well. He ends up kidnapping, essentially raping and, uh, a woman and killing her husband so that he can be with her. It's a longer story than that, but that's, that's the gist of it. And this is toward the end of his life when he should be a mature follower of God, but he's not that at this time, and he ends up getting punished for that. His son Solomon ends up stepping into power, and Solomon starts off as a good, noble, and wise king. Solomon helps build the temple and, and build the palace, and Solomon's a builder king, but by the end of his life, he has also married a bunch of foreign women. And it's not a problem. It's not that God doesn't like foreigners. It's that they had foreign gods, and those foreign gods led Solomon's heart astray, and he turned his back on the one true God. What follows after Solomon are a number of kings, most of them really bad, some of them completely wicked, and just a handful good kings that, who try to follow after the Lord with all of their heart. But because Israel keeps failing time and time and time again, God sends prophets to remind them of their sin and to remind them that God told them he would bless them as long as they would continue to follow him. But if they stop following him, he will remove his hand of protection from them, and their enemies will conquer them. They're even going to the temple in Jerusalem where God resides and worshiping false gods there. It's like there's no low that they won't sink to, but they won't turn back. So by the end of the Old Testament, Israel has been conquered by Babylon and Assyria. And they stand as a defeated people on the river Wondering where it all went so wrong. In fact, we have this psalm, Psalm 137, 1 through 3. Beside the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. They haven't been there in a long time. They've been taken away from their homeland at this point. We put away our harps, hanging them on the branches of poplar trees. And for our captors demanded a song from us. Our tormentors insisted on a joyful hymn. Oh, sing us one of the songs of Jerusalem, they said. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a pagan land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget how to play the harp. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I fail to remember you, if I don't make Jerusalem my greatest joy. By the end of the Old Testament, this is a defeated people. When Jesus comes to the temple and he talks to these religious leaders, what they know is the history of Israel. They have all this playing in the background. And what they know is that it's now been 400 years since they've been conquered by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. The same length of time they had been slaves in Egypt, they have now been conquered by the Babylonians and Assyrians, which eventually became the Romans. They are not in charge. They have not been blessed to be a blessing, and they keep wondering, will God not rectify this? Will God not rectify this? But still their hearts are dark. They've started to see Abraham's calling to be a blessing to the world as their own specialness. They believe that they are special before God, and they are increasingly tribalistic in their mindsets, that they are better than and set apart from the rest of the world, these other Gentiles. And how could they possibly have any part in the blessing of God? Generations of Israelites were born, lived, and died without ever seeing deliverance from God. And as Jesus, as a 12-year-old boy, is sitting in that temple, this is the history that those teachers are familiar with. And for 400 years, they feel like God has been silent. They've heard nothing from him. For 400 years, our, pl our, our, our place in life has been that we have our necks under the boots of other empires. And as Jesus is questioning them, what we will find out later is that 
is that they completely lost the plot. They knew the scriptures, but they hadn't followed after God with their hearts. They, they knew the scriptures, but they failed to grasp the wisdom of God. In every generation, it's possible for people to know the scriptures, but fail to grasp the wisdom of God. So, his parents find him, and he's talking with these teachers, and these teachers are amazed at his understanding. They're amazed at his answers. What 12-year-old can understand this? It's, it's easy maybe for a young person to memorize facts and be able to spit the facts back at you, but what Jesus is doing is wrestling with concepts and questioning them. It's not surprising that 12-year-old Jesus asked a lot of questions because adult Jesus also asked a lot of questions. Some of the most important answers in life are questions. What is the meaning of life? Where is God in the midst of our suffering? Some of the most important answers in life are questions. His parents didn't know what to think. They were very frustrated, I'm sure. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. And I love this response because it's unexpected. It's so unexpected. <laughs> but why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant, which means they probably weren't any less frustrated by this response. Like, you can think, it's been three days, right? They took a day away to travel. They had to take a whole day back to travel. And then they had to spend a day looking for him in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a dangerous place at this time of year. People are coming in with their offerings and their gifts. And there would be thieves in shadowy, narrow uh, alleys that are waiting to, like, try and rob them or take their stuff. And their boy, their 12-year-old son, has been in Jerusalem by himself on this third day. What do we do with this? Why did you do this to us? And he said, you should have known where I was. Why? Jesus, in his response, exhibits all the signs of a typical prodigy, a child genius. Geniuses don't see the world the rest, like the rest of us do. They just see it a little differently. And so there are things that come really easy to them, but there are other ways that lots of us would think that they just don't understand a lot of times. So, so when someone's a prodigy, they they, there's something that they're good at, that they, they're drawn to, and they, they spend all their time focusing and thinking about that thing, going after it constantly. And so sometimes they're a little out of touch in some other areas, right? Uh, a, a prodigy musician might have their, their violin with them all the time. A prodigy chess player might be constantly playing chess, whether online or in person. Jesus is a prodigy. He's a prodigy of faith. He's a prodigy of character. And he is sitting with these people at the temple because of course he is. Why did you have to look for me? You knew I would be right here, right? It's like if I can't find mine kids, I know they're playing Minecraft because they're prodigies. You knew I'd be here. He can't understand why they're upset because he doesn't see the world the way that they do. He wasn't trying to be disobedient and they weren't trying to be irresponsible parents. But because of the genius of Jesus, they just miss each other. They miss each other. And even when he tells them, they don't quite understand it. From a very, very early age, Jesus knew who he was and why he was here from very early on. By the way, what a gift that is. How many of us get to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old and we are still wrestling with these two questions? Who am I? And why am I here? Jesus knew early, early on who he was and why he was here. He was a prodigy who lived into his genius and it confounded even his parents even his parents. Now, one of the reasons I want us to lean in over the next several weeks as we then examine the greatest teachings of this genius is because I truly believe that sometimes we can find out new information and it will change the way that we see and interact with the world. Sometimes it can be big information, like what I think this sermon that Jesus gives is. Sometimes it can be small things. Just to give an example of this, I want to tell you about a small thing that my wife and I discovered recently that totally changed the world for us, and not in a great way. Recently, we were, on our, uh, we were traveling together, and we were listening to a podcast called Radio Lab. It's like a, it's like a technology and science podcast. They tell, really, they tell stories in really compelling ways. And uh, they had an interview uh, with, a, uh, with a woman named uh, Natasha Wagner, okay? Never heard of this woman, Natasha Wagner, but I found out that when, well, through the interview process that Natasha Wagner is a fit model. That means that all the clothes that you wear, all the clothes that I wear that we buy in stores, 
before they like mass produce them and send them out, there are a handful of models that they make sure that they fit them really well, and then they send it out. Natasha Wagner is a fit model. All of the genes that are made by these companies and about 14 other ones use specifically Natasha Wagner as their fit model. She has what they call a Goldilocks butt. It's not too big. It's not too little. Phrase I never thought I'd say in church <laughs> or anywhere. So she comes in, and so, so, if, uh, lady, so he, here's how this changed things for my wife. My wife uh, has been frustrated for years about trying to find things that, that fit the right way, and now she knows exactly who to blame. So, like, you know, she, she's always wondering, like, hey, why is it that when I sit down, right, like, a lot of times, even if the genes fit pretty well, when I sit down, there's, like, a kind of a gap in the back of the gene. I'm not going to show you a demonstration of that, okay? But, like, like, like why is that? Like, like, Emily said, I've been with my friends before, and we've been trying stuff on, or with my mom, or with relatives, or we're trying stuff on in stores, and we're like, like, who do they make these genes for? They make them for Natasha. Can you imagine walking into any store in the world, and every piece of clothing in it is perfectly tailored for your specific behind? That is the life that she lives. It's her full full-time job. And now that we have this information and we know that these are, there are these fit models, sometimes we'll be you know, at the mall and Emily will want to try something on. She'll go into a dressing room and she'll try it on and I'll hear her and I just love this and I'll hear her go, Natasha! <laughs> it's just, she's very upset. And Natasha knows how good she has it. Look at that smirk. She gets it. Like, like she is mocking all of you, okay? That's, that's how she's doing this. And so once we found this out, this is just a hilarious thing for us. We just didn't know that they did this, that all the clothes they make, they make for very specific models. And then they just find these models that they think are about the median of the population. And the rest of us spend the rest of our lives trying to fit into clothes created for other people, okay? That was just interesting. It was an interesting piece of information. What we learn can change how we see. There's no doubt about it. It's, you, you hear a little bit of information, and it can change everything for you. Over the next several weeks, I believe what we learn can change how we see. So what I'm inviting you to do is to lean in over the next several weeks as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest teaching from the most genius spiritual teacher who ever lived. Now, to be clear, I believe he was more than that. I believe he was also the Son of God. I believe that he performed miracles, that he died on a cross for our sin, and that he rose from the dead, and that in doing so, he defeated death, and he defeated sin, and he defeated the evil in the world. That's what I believe about Jesus. But as a starting place, if you're not there, I would encourage you to consider what he actually taught. And I want to tell you just a little bit of my story. And if you've been here a while, you've probably heard my story before. But if you're newer, I just think occasionally I just want to remind you of where I've come from. It's just helpful maybe for you to know where I've been. My story is that I grew up in a church home. You know, I, I grew up in a, a, a family that we, we went to church all the time. My dad is an evangelist. By the time I was in high school, I'd been to uh, hundreds of churches all around the United States and seen all kinds of things. I was a leader in my student group, my youth group, when I was in high school. I was, you know, one of, one of several. But we, we took our faith seriously, and we tried to ask what it looked like to live as a follower of Jesus in a modern world. And then I got into college, and I just started having a lot of questions. And what I realized when I got into college is that I had never actually made space for the questions and doubts I'd had earlier in life. It's not that anyone ever explicitly told me that my questions weren't welcomed in my church or in my family. It's just... I could kind of implicitly pick up that there were certain questions you just don't ask and certain topics you just don't talk about. And so I just stayed away from them, like they were nuclear. I just stayed away from them. But what happened is that over time, the weight of those questions and doubts started to add up to where it was really impacting my ability to have faith at all. By the time I graduated college and was probably a year out, I wasn't even sure if I was still a Christian because I wasn't sure if I believed this. I had gone to a Christian college. I was working on a church staff. I knew the stories, and I could talk about how helpful many elements of the faith had been to me, but I wasn't sure if I really believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I was wrestling with it, and I didn't even want to talk to my, my parents or my wife about it because I was afraid it would freak them out and scare them. I just didn't know what to do. And then uh, my wife and I drove eight hours one day uh, to go to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, from the place we were in Texas, to eat at a Mexican food restaurant. Because when you love something, you'll sacrifice for it. 
There's a Mexican food restaurant in Oklahoma City called Ted's Cafe Escondido. I know. How could any Mexican food restaurant called Ted's be good? It is delicious, okay? If you're ever in Oklahoma City, definitely go to Ted's Cafe Escondido. But they had this long wait, and this is before they had all the fancy pagers and they could text you and all that kind of stuff. So you just they gave you a time window. You would come and they'd be like, come back in two hours, and you'll probably only have to wait about 15 minutes and we can get you in. So we went to Borders. Borders was a store that sold books. For those of you who are younger, books are these paper... They're like paper websites, okay? And you're like, they're, yeah, it's like if TikTok videos were written down, okay? It's like that kind of thing. So, so we went to uh, Borders, and we were hanging out at Borders and having a really uh, fun time just looking around at different books. I went to the theology section, struggling with faith, just to see what was there. And I ran across a book written by a gentleman named Gregory Boyd, who would later become a, a major mentor of mine. And it was called Satan and the Problem of Evil. And it had some, like, <laughs> after first hour, someone told me, that's a really metal title. And I was like, yeah, totally. So it was that. And then it had this, this picture as well, like this, this painting from, like, the medieval era that looked just, just really interesting. So I just picked it up, this really big, thick, lots of footnotes. This guy was a graduate of, like, Stanford and Princeton and uh, brilliant theologian. And he was answering questions in a way that I'd never seen anyone answer them before. And it's not that I felt like he solved everything for me or that I necessarily agreed with it all, but it seemed compelling to me. So for the next several days, I read through the whole thing, and I thought, maybe, maybe Christianity has something for me yet. I appreciated that he was bringing up many of the questions that I had asked and answering them in ways I'd never heard anyone deal with them before. Then I found out he was going to be speaking at a small convention in Shipshawana, Indiana. And so I couldn't afford a plane ticket, but I asked my wife if I could drive our Volkswagen Jetta to Shipshawana, Indiana, you know, the epicenter of progressive culture, and if I could sit with Gregory Boyd and maybe listen to his teaching. There's only about 70 people at this conference, and I thought maybe I have a chance to talk to him, kind of one-on-one and answer questions. So uh, I, I drove all the way there. Uh, it was a, a town with a lot of Amish in it, and I had never really seen that before, so that was interesting. We sat down and, uh, at this, in this you know, little room with a few seats, and he came in and taught, and because I just read his book, I felt like I was in the presence of a rock star, right? And he, he gave this really compelling uh, talk, and then afterwards I, I walked up to him and I was like, hey, I don't know if you have a little bit of time, but I've got a few questions. And a couple of other people walked up with some questions as well. And that night, Greg gave us three hours of his time to sit just a handful of us and ask question after question after question. And look, it's not that I got everything resolved in one night or anything like that, but what I did determine that night is the question that I should ask So I traded like dozens of questions that I had written down in notebooks for one really important one. And here's what the question was. Is Jesus worth following? He invites us to. Is he worth following? That to me simplified all the questions I had. Because if I was honest with myself, while I had grown up in church, while I knew a lot of the Bible stories, I had never actually taken a lot of time to sit with the stories and teachings of Jesus and really try to internalize them myself. I mean, I've been in church for years. I spent the next several months reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels in the New Testament, over and over and over again. I kept a a little daily journal about how I was going to try to incorporate a different teaching of Jesus in my life on any particular day. And what I found over the next several months is that when I lived my life in a similar way that Jesus taught me to live it, it was a better life. I was a better man. I was more enjoyable to my wife and to my friends. And I just saw the world in a more different and beautiful way. It wasn't that the ugliness and darkness of the world totally went away. It's that I had something I hadn't felt in several years. Hope. Hope that something could change. Hope that something could transform. Hope that genius could be transferred. Later, I started to believe if he was so right about the way to live, perhaps he was right about who he claimed to be. Perhaps he was right about how important the scriptures are. Perhaps he's right about the way I should spend my life. Perhaps I should just start calling him my Lord, my boss, the person who gets to tell me what to do. That's my story. And what I learned over the course of it is that doubts and questions are not a threat to faith. Rather, if you don't work through your doubts and questions, it's impossible to have a vibrant faith. They will always sit at the back of your mind, waiting to trip you up or to 
make you less excited or enthusiastic about your faith because you have these reservations. And if you never work through them, you'll never really get to a true faith. So over the next several weeks, I'm going to invite you to lean in. If you're a follower of Jesus, maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for years or decades, a question for you is, do I have a lot of biblical knowledge but not the wisdom of God? If you're not a follower of Jesus, a question to ask is, is Jesus worth following? My, uh, my friend Damon uh, went over to uh, Disneyland with me this last weekend. Uh, our friends Damon and Cindy are visiting us from Pennsylvania. And Damon had never been to Disneyland before. And so uh, what I noticed is that he would pull his phone out and he would start recording every single awesome ride that we were on. And I could tell whether he was enjoying the ride by how much footage he got of the ride. They have this new Mickey and Minnie ride, and it's, it's rad. And he, was, he recorded, like, the entire ride. We went on Pirates of the Caribbean, and he recorded the entire ride. And then we went on It's a Small World, and he didn't pull his phone out of his pocket one time. <laughs> over the next several weeks pull your recorder out of your pocket lean into this sermon on the mount it's worth it it can transform you it can change you and if it can change you it can change your corner of the world and if it can change your corner of the world change the whole world. Father, thank you for this Sermon on the Mount. Thank you for the genius of Jesus. Lord, I, I pray that over the next several weeks, his genius is transformative and transferable. May we become more like him by studying what he was like. Lord, may, may we venture into these several chapters of text that he gave us, which ended up like shifting the whole trajectory of history. May we enter into them with eager expectation that you might actually do something in our lives if we start to like study it and internalize it and live it. May we start to recognize that like, man, Christianity is about so much more than just Bible knowledge, but it is about like, it is about sitting with Jesus and learning from Jesus how to be like Jesus. And I pray that we would have a heart to do that and to be that. It's in his name we ask these things. Amen.